my best. I really don't like lecterns because it, it makes me feel too formal. And this is an absolutely informal conversation. So first of all, I want to thank you for allowing me to spend some time with you and share some, some thoughts, some experiences, and I have some requests and suggestions in that order, I hope. I, um, I'm an interloper. I'm not an IETF member. I have read RFCs. I've questioned RFCs. And I've implemented RFCs. But that's the limit of my IETF exposure. I, um, what I want to share with you is what I call a, um, you know, a view from the field or report from the field. I've been a security practitioner for quite some time. When I say security, I mean traditional cybersecurity. But before that, then and there was a before that, I was deeply involved with several engineering disciplines. And as many of us, especially those of us over 40, we fell into networking. We didn't, desi we didn't desire to go into networking. So for the con for context setting for this conversation, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I, um, I started to read Mark Twain when I was forced to in Jesuit high school. So I always take liberty with some of his quotes. And over the years, the more I've been involved with the internet, truly, the more I love my dog. And my dog does have, a, does have an IP address, by the way. He has a chip. And that chip is more than just tracking. It has all of her health records. It has her vaccination schedule. It has her likes and dislikes for food. And if I'm lucky, I can actually track her, too. That's a byproduct. But it's, it's, it sets the tone for where we are today. IETF is 30 years old, and congratulations. Very few organizations of any type can last 30 years. 30 years ago, I had just completed my first uh, major series of projects. So let me give you a little bit of background. My first job out of university was at Argonne National Laboratories. Now, I didn't know anything about nuclear physics. I didn't know anything about national battery testing labs. I didn't know anything about much of anything except I could write good real-time code. And by real time, it meant it was done, in, it was not done in real time, but it was for systems that ran in real time. And basically today we call these embedded systems. So I'm, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, Midwest boy, drive to Chicago, and I go to the labs and big burly men with guns greet me. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? What am I getting into here? And as they escort me to my first building, there are these very short, very albino deer. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I know they have nuclear stuff here. And you know, I'm thinking deer, and I'm seeing deer, and something's not correlating. And I'm thinking, what am I getting myself into? And then I meet the lab director, who was very gracious, and welcomed the newcomer, and said, I know you're thinking about the deer, aren't you? And it's in all honesty, yes, sir, it did cross my mind. He goes, don't worry, they were bred this way. They're from Switzerland, and it was part of the deal for the land grant for Argonne National Labs. And I'm sticking to it. So my first job was writing code for uh, one of the reactors that Argonne had at the time. It's called the TREAT reactor, it's a thermal test reactor. And I wrote code for folks who were far, far smarter than I am. In fact, several were up for, Nobel, for the Nobel years later. But it was like a Disneyland for nerds. You know, you could do anything. Everything you wanted was there. There was, you know, time was kind of an option, but delivery and accuracy was critical. So I wrote code for the treat reactor to manage the, the, uh, the calimeter, which moved back and forth. And the, the physicists can do their physics stuff or whatever, and 
they wanted to make sure that the data I gave them was correct and it was all that kind of nonsense. So I did that, they were happy, my boss was happy, and nothing glowed. So that was success, and good times, right? So back in the day, you know, people would play around in the middle of a nuclear reactor. How, how quaint, you know. Yeah, I guess that's, then they decided to put the signs up. So I cut my teeth on real-time systems. And part of that was making uh, not only the analog, digital, and digital analog conversions, all that stuff, which is easy, but making systems that weren't meant to talk to each other talk to each other. That was my introduction to networking. Although we didn't call it networking then, we just called it control planes. Not to, use, not, to confer, uh, not to be confused with today's control plane. So well, about 25 years after I left this program, I ran across one of the uh, departmental directors who had retired. I was invited to his, re his retirement. He goes, hey, you know, Kevin, they're still running this, the, the reactor with your code 25 years later. Now, this is in western Idaho. So if you ever <clears throat> go to western Idaho, don't. I would fly all around it to make sure that you know, Kevin's 40-year-old code is still running there somewhere on the reactor. But what I, what I did realize was that I liked the communications narrative. I liked that. It was fun. Uh, in, in, at, at university, I had to, instead of taking a, 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 a spoken language, I took Fortran and APL. And it qualified for, for, for language, which was hilarious. But um, I really enjoyed making things work that weren't meant to work together. So after Argonne, I ended up at a, a company who, who was subcontracted to do DDN, if you remember that, Defense Data Network, the, the Milnet separation. And then I really got to understand and know networking the hard way in a classified environment with, where time was a commitment and the notion of security was now introduced to me at a very young, as a very young engineer. So in 1986, the year IETF was founded, it was an interesting year for a lot of things. Um, we had Top Gun, that was awesome, cool. Uh, Microsoft went public and so uh, the notorious Willie G became on his way to being a billionaire. Um, we had the Mac SE, if you remember that. But that was the first time that the Apple, that the Macintosh gained credibility in business. So it was a big thing for some of us who were Apple devotees back in the day. And we had the internet looking something like this. And as I said, I was working on DD, had just come off of working on DDN. Yep, done. And then I had moved to this little university on the East Bay of, 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 of the San Francisco Bay Area. Some of you may have heard of it, Berkeley. It's, yeah, well, if you notice all the universities to the right are all East Coast, and they, and they threw in a little carrot to Berkeley. But I was working on BSD and uh, among other things, the, uh, some of the BSD stack came my way, my team's way, including Bind. And I always thought that was a terrible, terrible name because it really put us in a bind where, from, where we're in a, a period where we're making the transitions from proprietary networks to, of course, um, uh, TCP IP based. But it was a learning experience. But what I took from that, from my experiences prior, especially on the, working under DDN, was that we, practitioners, need to think about a future state where we don't know everyone who is going to be working with us, communicating with us, and, and associating with us. We won't know them. It wasn't that we were so prescient that we, 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 for, you know, we foresaw the collapse of 32-bit uh, address space, not, not even close. But we were already going from 2,000 networks to 30,000 networks in a very short period. And it all, they always weren't people that we knew. They always weren't associations that we knew. We needed a different model. So there were a group of us who kind of banded together, of course. Uh, I don't know if you've been to Berkeley, but the, 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 one of the great, uh, the great artifacts of the university is some of the best food in the world. We call it gourmet ghetto. I think there's been at least 20 companies started on either on the telegraph side or the 
the other side of campus, but we would go and, and just collaborate and say, look, what can we do that's different? What can we do with the tools available? Or, oh, by the way, we know how to write code, so we can write new tools. What could we do? And we got shouted down. We got shouted down, quite simply, uh, by the Moats and Castle folks, who simply said, put up big barriers and move on. We don't have time. So I, I, I share that with you because I look back now uh, as a practitioner and wish, and wish that I had the, the temperament, the experience, and the voice for that team then to have stood up and say, no, we need to do this the right way now. Now, fast forward, I'm going to close out on a little bit about, about, about me, and that is the last 18 years I've been uh, solely focused on cybersecurity uh, and including multiple CISO roles um, and a few startups, uh, successful startups, frankly, too, which is, is, a, is a benefit, too. <coughs> Excuse me. But what I want to share with you are some of the pitfalls, challenges that we all face, those who are designing the internets, I said plural, intentionally, and those who are operating the internet, internets. 1986 also was a time where things that weren't so pleasant happened, Chernobyl. By the way, Chernobyl wasn't the first runaway, we all know that, but it was one of the largest. In fact, for those who are interested, the first meltdown, uncontrolled meltdown, was actually at, at Argonne in 55. And of course, we had the Challenger. Now, keep these in mind as we go through the, this, uh, this afternoon's discussion. These were extremely catastrophic events that were caused by oversight, undersight, just human error. Both could have been avoided. We know that in retrospect. But they could have been avoided locally. That's why I'm going to pause for that for now. So after 18 years of running security teams, uh, just prior to joining Juniper, which was eight months ago, I was a CISO at Walmart.com, for those in, in Great Britain, as ASDA, um, permanently attacked. Uh, I had the situation where customers, 200 million customers, came to me already compromised, but want to buy things. That's the real world. That's Amazon. That's us. I mean, them, sorry. Freudian slip. That's um, companies who have to take financial instruments with a username and a password. And then, oh, by the way, I don't care how strong your password is, it doesn't matter when the, key, when the keystroke logger has been on your computer for the last two years. I would get data dumps from uh, the dark web purveyors, and it would start with 1,000 credentials a week, then 2,000, until it hit a crescendo of 250,000 unique credentials in a week of my customers. And oh, by the way, they have some great passwords in there. Extremely good. In fact, I use one of them now. They're so good. But they were compromised, so it doesn't matter. So how do you actually conduct commerce when your customer's coming to you and you have to determine whether, whether she's real or not? Well, clearly you have to use other analytic tools to determine the buying behavior patterns, all that kind of good stuff. And oh, by the way, geolocation is not one of them. It's irrelevant. But whether or not you go directly to, to, to the electronics section and buy five iPads is a hint. Whether or not you change your, your shipping address is another hint. Whether you do the myriad of, 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 of activities that the traditional uh, thieves will do are the hints, not your user password and not your geolocation. So I'm just throwing it out there. It's just a little bit of a pet peeve of mine where people think, oh, stronger passwords, stronger passwords, and I can give you all the strong passwords you want. It's irrelevant. So after practicing this wonderful, fun, and um, you know, low taxing occupation for 18 years, I figured, what can we do to change the internet? So I did what anyone with a modicum of intelligence would do, and that's I asked Siri. So I asked Siri how to improve the internet, uh, the internet 
for security. You know, you can see some of her answers there. It wasn't really that helpful. So if you know Siri, you know that it's, some, it's like Google search. You have to ask the question in the right way. So I try it again. And not much help. So I figured, you know, what better place to go to ask these questions than IETF? So here I am. <laughs> so a little bit of quick, a quick run on history. Many of us in the room have been there, but for some of us have not or may have uh, uh, intentionally forgotten. The, in 1986, the year internet, uh, IETF was founded, there were zero known internet attacks. Zero. It's easy. I mean, it's a trick question why, but I think we all know. <laughs> the internet wasn't really there yet. It was kind of there, but not quite there. And we all, we all knew all 2,000 of the sites. But in 88, we had the first, and of course, that's the Morris Worm. I was at Cal still, at a research team, and we got slammed with, with the Morris Worm. It was more like the Morris Slug, but, but our machines were slow, so Worm was fast enough. But what that did was that raised the consciousness of, oh my God, we really have to do something, because I'm not in control of my assets. I had... Uh, I was between the BSD team and the ACS, which is the Academic Community Center team. So on the academic side, I had professors and, and true Nobel laureates screaming at me from, from Switzerland and from uh, all parts of Europe saying, I can't get to my system, I can't get to my system, I'm, I'm giving a presentation or whatever. It's like, do chill, before we said do chill. I said, we don't know what's going on. That was a wake-up moment for me and my team, especially the folks who were writing a lot of the code that people were relying on. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't have the, the wherewithal and the tools at the time to determine it. So if you read the, the Cuckoo's Nest, you know, Cliff Stoll and all that kind of stuff, you know, I mean, anybody who would spend as much time as Cliff did going through his phone records probably needs a life. But we were trying to figure out what was going on in real time, and I'm going to tell you, this was an eye-opening experience and one that I don't want to, I don't want to repeat, because we, no one knew. And I underscore that. The NSF folks didn't know. Uh, we had contacts at IBM, they didn't know. Nobody really knew on the first day when it was started. But I bring this up because since then, of course, the attacks have gotten far more sophisticated, far more uh, 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 targeted and far more effective. So 2016, don't even worry about counting. It's just insane. You can spend, there are companies built on trying to calculate how much of the impact there is on the internet from attacks. It's silly, it's a specious, it's a specious set of, 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 of descriptors from my perspective because it doesn't matter. The real number that matters is how many are, are, are breaches of significance and the best estimates are around about one a week of a significant breach. Now, and I, I say this with authority. I used to also be the CISO at Symantec in Iran, uh, one of the first research groups we had on, on breach detections. So the, the consensus around those who do this daily is that it's about a one a week. That's, so it's 50 plus a year of successful breaches. So on the malware side, things are a little different. Because frankly, if you pay me to break in, and oh, by the way, I used to do that as well. We, we didn't use the term white hat hacking. I hated that term. Uh, but we were favorable hackers. And I almost always got in at layer seven. In fact, we never not got in. There are a few times we got in through the plumbing by, by virtue of looking at change control, for example. And in fact, we could, uh, through our reconnaissance, we can tell m most companies, we actually had a log, now the bad guys in the darknet sell it, of when companies had their change control. JP Morgan Chase, for example, let's throw that name out there, it's not necessarily them, Tuesday at 7 p.m., we knew it. So Tuesday about 10 p.m. is when we try our pens, because guess what? Typically, through a change control window, mistakes are made. So that was, that was just the ripe time for phishing, right? So we did that, um, and so layer seven. Now, having said that, when people made mistakes on changes and change controls, it usually was, a, was either a deprecated or uh, an older release 
for example, a good one was always, oh, we, first thing we did, everyone does, right? You go for SNMP and DNS. You just go right for that. It's easy. It's like the, you know, the slow gazelle. And when they, when they made a mistake, bam, we're in. They don't know it. We're sitting there. It was just very, very common. Fast forward, today it's a lot harder because so much is also being done uh, in the cloud. And I'm going to talk about that later. But the cloud actually is a really great buffer from a security perspective. A very great buffer makes it a lot harder and not impossible. So in 1986, there were six confirmed, well-known uh, viruses. Because what happened was the folks who were actually collecting the viruses, for, first of all, were doing sneaker net. That's the only way of really doing it. Um, it was very difficult to, to transfer viruses other than physical media. And the, the, the virus writers were basically academics anyway. So it wasn't that, the, the landscape wasn't that bad. You know, you had John McAfee and Peter, and Peter uh, Norton running around in their vans in, in, in San Jose literally driving around their vans to pick up, you know, pick up uh, virus samples. So it was, a, it was a much easier time. Well, today, they're well over a million a day. The asterisk is that these are almost all variants. Uh, when you talk to the trends of McAfee semantics and the like, they'll tell you, and so folks, they'll tell you that it's not a lot uniqueness there, but it's enough of a spin to still cause a problem. And this is today's th uh, threat level. We're always at orange. I don't know why they even bother. It's always there. But we had, a, we had a time when it was easy to identify and, and, pre and prevent malware. AV is dead. It doesn't know it yet. It's dying under its own demise from having to maintain 20, 30 years of history. Because all I do as a, need as an attacker is to go back to an old problem, an old CVE, right? And that happens all the time. Because we're all, we're, we're all focused on the latest and greatest, but we forget about what the CVE won, which still exists, it's there. So AV is dying, and it's dying a slow death. We need a new way of, of approaching that, and there are folks doing that, and doing it in a fairly good way, I believe, in my, in my opinion. And we've gone from defacing to destruction. It's no longer site defacement taking over, with some exception, especially around the uh, hacktivism, political hacktivism, but now we're talking about changing records, changing records in the financial community to put your thumb on the scale for euro to dollar uh, transfer rates. It's talking about modifying health records to intentionally harm an individual or a hospital. We're talking about taking over HVAC systems. We're talking about water filtration systems. We're talking about the things that can hurt people or kill people. This is reality. This is reality caused less by the financial impact, which we all hear about. We hear about this all the time about taking your credit cards. By the way, the credit card value has been dropping precipitously uh, over the years. Your credentials are the coin of the realm right now in the dark net. So the financial impact is interesting, it's important, but those who want to cause harm by leveraging the internet itself can cause death and destruction. Remember the Challenger and remember Chernobyl. Well, the nuclear sites, of course, are mm, air-gapped. I don't know, I'm not involved anymore. But what I hear is that there are there's a pause, and they say, yes, we're air-gapped. But still, they still use, of course, uh, uh, TCP IP throughout. So somebody who can jump the fence or, inter or interject, who knows? It's scary to me. As a practitioner, as someone who's been involved in that space, it's a little scary to me. On the, on the side with, um, uh, uh, like, like the, I'm sorry, aviation, not necessarily the challenger, I'm very scared. Uh, we hear these stories about people taking over and everything. That's nonsense, by the way. They basically did the maintenance mode that's, that's on the ground. They can't do it in the air yet. 
Tesla had their first incident with, with their autonomous driving software. It's going to have problems. Unfortunately, someone did die. Now, that person probably should not have, should have been taking, paying more attention from what I understand without clearing out on the details. But the fact of having cars being taken over we have, has been demonstrated time and time and time again. A targeted attack by, on a vehicle is going to happen. Unfortunately, is going to happen. And that scares me as a practitioner, because what can we do that's better so that it can't happen, or it's extraordinarily rare to, uh, for the type of an attack? 2010 was a pivotal year. A lot of things happened uh, on the malware and the attack scene. Project Aurora, if you had not heard of it, that was a very widespread, uh, very likely nation state attack. But it, it doesn't matter who did it, it happened. Code was expunged, I mean, was, I'm sorry, uh, was re removed from a lot of companies. But the reason I bring up Aurora in particular is because five years prior, that exact same attack happened to me and a couple of other companies. But we didn't share. We could have prevented it had there been a mechanism to make some of these changes. It didn't happen. So Aurora came back five years later far more effective. We also had a couple of, um, we had Stuxnet, right? Well, Stuxnet forever changed the game. We also had uh, Shumun, if you don't remember, if you remember that, Shumun, I'm sorry, if you remember that as well. Both of those in around 2010. The reason why they were, they were so impactful, because now they're showing that I can do destruction on equipment over the internet. Okay, okay, the genie's out of the bottle now. It's not going back. No, Shimun was kind of cool because it just destroyed 30,000 PCs, which was interesting. I mean, there was a rumor that Dell did it, but that's just a rumor. But it forever changed the, the face of these attackers because some are politically motivated, some are financially motivated, and some are just motivated. But the fact is they can actually cause harm shut down refineries, shut down hospitals. Things are changing. On the network side, everybody can take a deep breath. It's not a lot going on there. Why? And I think we all know the answer. We're fairly resilient, right? Uh, but DDoS still does work. And the reason why it works <coughs> is because it works. <laughs> it's, you know, remember the first time I had a 140 gig attack, I'm going, oh, wow, I don't have a 141 gig pipe, so I'm in trouble, right? And I talked to my peers, I said, how do you guys defend against DDoS attacks? Add more pipes. Well, things are changing. Uh, we have other mitigation strategies. We have the cloud. Uh, many organizations, especially Fortune 100 companies, are pushing, as you well know, uh, they're pushing their uh, uh, their turn points into the into the cloud, and you know, like a like an Akamai uh, with Kona and all that good stuff. It works. It's not the ideal, but it works. So 50 50 Gs are still fairly prevalent. There's a two a 620 claimed. Uh, we know of a 510 that was successful. We believe it's a 620 that was claimed. But the the point though is, a lot of times the DDoS attack director ruse. And, and the reason why I brought this point up was because it actually, again, happened to me, where we're, everyone is scrambling, you know, so anybody left to focus on the DDoS attack when we realized we were actually already being just snarfed like crazy. So it does still occur. The, the efficacy from the, from the attacker's perspective is not there. If I'm an attacker, I want your content, who cares if I'm going to uh, uh, take your site down? I don't, I don't care about that. What I want is, is our... Uh, either creds, I want your, your intel, I want your IP. So DDoSing doesn't, doesn't really get you there. So over, for over 30 years, here are some of my observations. Number one, from a cybersecurity perspective, is that hygiene is still appalling. This is nothing that you can necessarily address from an IETF perspective, with an asterisk. I believe there are some, we'll talk about some suggestions that I have. But the, 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 the need for uh, companies to do a better job is acute. And there are reasons why we don't. For example, if you ask a CIO how many applications she has in her portfolio, 
well over a thousand, some 20, 22 years old. And you know, it's just not easy to refresh that. So there are a lot of, they're, they're mitigating uh, a, a rationale for some of the hygiene problems. The hygiene problem is the biggest one because again, as an attacker, that's how I get in. Poor designs, poor procedures, and horrific coding. Again, that's how I get in. Automation is something we talk a lot about on the operation side and do very, very little about it. But the one of the reasons why we don't do a lot of more automation is because it's hard. It's extremely hard. And we're doing automation on systems that weren't designed to be automated. So you see lots and lots of Python writers, <laughs> lots and lots of Python scripts, trying to do things that are adding very inadequate band-aids to a very fundamental problem. And of course, the 800 pound gorilla is complexity. And the complexity dialogue is one that we know we have to address, but I don't hear answers of how to address it. If you look at a typical organization, Fortune 500, 35 to 70,000 compute elements, physical, we haven't gotten to virtual yet, probably on the order of several thousand routers and switches, right, and firewalls, several thousand, many, many thousand. And then, oh, by the way, that 1,000 plus app legacy applications that the CIO is struggling with. Ask anyone what's going on. That's a problem from a cybersecurity perspective that's acute. What we call our management plane from cyberspace are all the tools, our IDS, IPS, firewalls, uh, our SEMs, everything that we use from a security uh, perspective is dying under its own weight. The average Fortune 500 company has somewhere in the order of 40 different products. Count them, 40 different products. And so what I asked my last two teams to do was tell me where you're spending your time. Not that I'm micromanaging, I just want to know. And we came up with 42% of the time in my last org was managing the management plane. That's care and feeding, patches, updates, tuning. It's insane, totally insane. But yet, that's what so many organizations are doing. It's a roller coaster ride that we got to get off of. So one of the things I did it was, was I took an arbitrary number. I said, okay, I'll tell you what. We're going to go from actually it was 42, from 42 products to 10. And my lead architect said, why 10, Kevin? I said, well, because I can count to 10 easily. And I can manage that. I can manage those companies. So that's where I, I often cite Phil Zimmerman. You know, PGP is pretty good privacy. It's not perfect privacy. So I had a lot of overlapping products in the portfolio and all that. We collapsed it down, and sure enough, it really helped us. I got time back in our pockets to actually do the hard work that we should be doing. But this is not sustainable. And oh, by the way, I, don't, I argue that, that even those 10 that I came down to didn't make me tremendously safer, secure, I should say. We have a problem. And we have to be able to manage through this without being so tied to our own solutions. We, ha we lack insights into the network. And as a consumer, as a practitioner, we lack insights into the network. And of course, we all know the talent uh, trivial, I mean, uh, problems. Everyone has that, that's universal. But it's made more acute when I'm spending 42% of my time managing my management system. Oh yeah, complexity. So we're in, a, we're in a, a world where the consumers, <laughs> the consumers want ease, which is why I'm back to my you know, username password for buying lots of, lots of stuff online, and they don't want to change it. They won't, they won't use OT, want OTPs or anything. That's okay. We'll work around it. The designers, the administrators, and the attackers. I hope you see a theme coming on here. And we're stuck with, okay, I tell you what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you. The certificate for this site, 
by the way, this is made up, it's not real juniper, but it's made up, is not trusted. Okay. This is not gonna go away from the user community. It's not, let's, let's understand that. We have to understand that someone decided to throw this up as a warning to the user that, hey, you may not wanna do this. And the user's going, whatever, I gotta get over there. This is what we are dealing with. And we're dealing with it at a very, very large scale. We need to change the paradigm. We really fundamentally have to change the paradigm. And this is the beginning of my ask of IETF. So we've been working in a, in a world for almost 40 years now of assumed trust, right? If you, if you give me, if you, if you can shake my hand in the proper way, in a not so secret way, we're good, come on in. Well, we have to start to change that. I think, um, you know, DNSSEC is on the right direction. Why the adoption isn't higher, I have no idea. I just really don't understand that one. I scratch my head like all the time on this one. It's like, well, wait a minute, they have a really good solution. Why aren't we using it? Go ahead, please. Convenience. Oh, I'm sorry, you read the slide. Exactly. And that's exactly the, the challenge we have. We have to get past that. We collectively, that's me on the user community and you on the design community, we have to do a better job because this is not sustainable. I do not want to be responsible for some, for some targeted attack on an on a autonomous driving vehicle. I don't want to be there. I don't want to have the responsibility on my, on my shoulders. Um, convenience. So let's talk about convenience since we're here. Who is the one that's inconvenienced? The designer, the implementer, or the, or the, or the consumer? Consumer being, in this case, uh, I'm sorry? Consumer. No, wrong answer. All of us should be inconvenienced equally. That we're the ones who have to deal with it, right? We're the ones who have to implement it, and, and oh, by the way, add more stuff to, to, to circumvent the weaknesses. Back to my 42 different security services. That is not sustainable. We have to inconvenience everyone a little bit. We're all in this together, all three, all three organizations, all three groups. So I think one of the things is to <clears throat> consider in any new design, reputation. I am a tremendous believer in crowdsourcing. It works. It's hard to put your thumb on a scale in crowdsourcing. People may be wrong in a crowd, right? We see this all the time in elections, right? People can be wrong in a crowd, but that's okay. Because you have a, now you have a much better indication of, of the explicit trust. Not 100%, but now, you're, now you have a weight to add to your decision. One of the things we don't do, as we all know, is that we don't, we don't associate um, affirmatively, with the exception of SEC DNS as an example. That's why, I mean, DNS SEC, that's why I like it. That's a great model to use. Yes, it's hard. Yes, circuit, I mean, certificates and PKI are hard. And, it's, and it's clearly it's not a panacea. Um, one of the, when I was at Symantec, we were, gonna, you know, we were in the PKI business. And you know, we all know if you've been to a signing ceremony with your hood and everything, right, it's kind of cool. It's difficult. It's difficult to manage. It's difficult to manage when, when individuals leave your company who are part of the signing. Right. This is hard. This is very hard. But we have to stand up and take that challenge. I think that, again, uh, DNSSEC isn't a good example of a framework, but as we come up with new protocols, especially for key important protocols, not for everything, we have to consider affirmatively associating. This is the one that troubles me the most on the implementer side. I have three implementations of SNMP. One that meets the letter and the spirit of the RFC. One that meets the letter, one meets the spirit. Guess which two I'm gonna attack. And guess which two I probably will get in. We have to reduce that ambiguity. Now, I say this from a different perspective. I came from an ANSI world. I was on two ANSI committees. And as we all know, you can make your entire career used to in ANSI. 
because of the, the longevity and the long pull, I mean, sorry, the long tail of, 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 of excuse me, ratification and implementation. But at the end, there was very little room for ambiguity. There was some, of course, because why humans are still involved. But we need to address this problem because as a practitioner, I see variations all over the place. And some of those variations are well-known uh, weaknesses. Some are not. Some are extraordinarily subtle. But, that, but the bad guys can figure it out because they've got time and money on their side. And oh, by the way, they have conferences like this. They share knowledge. They sell knowledge, too. Assume ill intent. That's what's happening. This is not new news. I'm sorry, this is not news breaking. This is what's happening. If we, if we design with the assumption of ill intent, we won't be perfect. But as Phil Zimmerman said, we'll be pretty good. This is a change in paradigm. As a practitioner, I'm asking this, this consideration. Automation is going to help us collectively in profound ways. I had a rule for, one of my for a couple of my teams is that if you did any activity more than twice a week, it was subject to automation. Doesn't mean you have to automate it, but consider it. And again, it was remarkable when folks spent the time, the inconvenience, to write either the scripts or the tool to help them automate, it paid itself back time after time after time. Federation is something that we, that we don't talk about a lot. When I mean federation, I'm not talking about identity necessarily, but just federation in the sense that my domain, especially if I'm a large organization, I have the wherewithal to manage. We kind of know what we're doing, right? Let us do that. And so, so that we can do that from everything from authentication, authorization, um, uh, uh, lookups, our, our, our caching could be a controlled and vetted caching, for example. Let's assume that that federation capabilities there. It's not there for everybody, it won't be, but for large organizations, it certainly can be. And virtualization, of course, we all know this is nothing new, but assume that's going to be the default. If I'm, if I'm building anything today, it's starting with, with virtualization. Now, there we go. And the network itself has to be part of the solution. It does. So for all the network practitioners, we have to be part of the solution and not, and, and not um, an innocent bystander. It's almost like this smart highway. You know, we have to be part of that solution. So if we don't do this right, when that intelligent vehicle is a targeted attack and someone dies, we will see far more legislation which gives us less flexibility to do the things that we believe are right. I'm not saying this as an observer. I've, I've been very active on the Hill. I've been brought in many times to talk to both Congress and Senate in the US uh, and, and the EU in Brussels about pending legislation and the impact. Well, look, this is, this is real. There are some terrible legislations that are already in place. To, to date, with the exception of one, they have not been prescriptive. That's the next generation. They're going to tell us how to do our work by laws, and of course, that's something we don't want. But if we, now I'm going to pause there for a quick second because uh, in the US, there was, an, there was an executive order in 2012. The president said, thou shalt sit, uh, share uh, uh, intelligence with the private sector. Didn't happen. Four years later, three years later, uh, a law came out, CISA in the US basically said the same thing, but who to share with was always the problem. Because if you're a vertical, like a financial industry, and like, fine, you've been doing it for years. But if you're not, who do you share it with, right? Yet, and so now there's a statute that says, now you have to share, you have to consume it. And there's no vehicle to do it. So this is, a, this is the artifact, a poor artifact of laws that we have to be careful with. And we, if we do our job right, we can help to circumvent some of this. This is definitely a... Uh, my soapbox, sorry about that, but it's been years and years and years on this. Thank you. I will take questions, by the way. Go ahead. Please. Carrie Lynn. Uh, in an earlier uh, century, uh, something like the launch of Sputnik really changed uh, you know, the education system in the United States, and a lot of us are sort of the product of that, at least those of us with gray hair. Um, it seems to me that uh, 
you know, what you're sort of implying is we really need to do things a lot differently. We need to uh, change the way we educate computer science students. Um, who exactly is going to make that clarion call and who's going to set, you know, the agenda? That is a very, very good question. I too, even though I don't have gray hair yet, if I had a beard it would be, um, I was a student of the 60s. And there, we do need that clarion call. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm very involved with STEM. Um, our, my company is very involved with STEM. But maybe it's an example where an IETF can outreach. You know, I don't know. I, don't, I wish I had the answer to that, but that's the, the first step in a 12-step program is this, acknowledging we have a problem. And I, I, I intentionally try to scare people, and I don't use that, I usually don't with cybersecurity, but what I'm starting to see now, and starting to see things that, are, that people can die, I get nervous. And we collectively are part of that. So I suggest maybe uh, the outreach from IETF, I don't, again, I'm, I'm an interloper, I just happen to drop in and, and hopefully share some words with you, uh, but we have to do something. STEM is, is, very, is a very, in thing right now, it may be the right vehicle. I will tell you, um, coming from academia, the teaching of computer science is woefully, un it's, just, it's just ridiculous, it still is. Um, people are focusing on pen testing and breaking things, not designing things to be resilient from a security attack. And we have to change that as well. But I hear you loud and clear. Again, the IETF, and if, if, if I can help, I'm more than happy to help with that. Hi, uh, I'm Daniel Kahn Gilmore from the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, so thanks for coming today, and I totally agree with you that we have this, there's, that there's a set of massive problems around secured infrastructure and, and trust. Um, and I, um, I had a question for you specifically in your role as a Juniper security officer um, about the recent screen OS vulnerabilities. Um, you guys had used dual EC in your, uh, in the screen OS devices, um, and with, with a, with a custom queue um, so that when the dual EC vulnerability was announced uh, and, and, made, and made quite clear, uh, I believe your response was, it's okay, we use, we use our own queue. So my question for you was, um, well, I guess it's sort of a two-part thing, but why did you choose to use dual EC RPG when it was slower than the other RNGs in the first place? And two, how did you generate your own queue? What, did you, what mechanism did you use for that? So so I'm going to answer this the following way. We have formally responded in our, in our FAQ, uh, which we're still, is, is still our, our vehicle, our, um, our response, our uh, uh, definitive response. You can debate re rewinding the, R, um, the RNG discussion at that time. I wasn't with Juniper, but I was implementing ECC and we were debating amongst ourselves how to do it right. Nobody knew the proper way then, when this was originally done. So I'm gonna leave it with that and, and, and kindly ask that you review the FAQ. I believe it may have been refreshed, I'm not so sure, but. Um, okay, but, but from, from your point about trust and that we need to sort of assume that devices are malicious that, are, that we are interacting with over the network, I'm wondering, I mean, surely you understand that there's a, that Juniper suffered a, uh, uh, like trust in Juniper devices must have gone down as a result of seeing the, the series of vulnerabilities that were announced. Right. And I'm wondering if you have any proposals for how we can restore trust in the Juniper networks. Like, have you guys considered, for example, um, opening your source control uh, so that people can see what actually happened? Um, or, or any other... Yeah, no, no, I hear you. And I, really, I really, and I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying this to... to to kind of shortcut the answer, but I do appreciate the question. It's a valid question, but I believe we've answered, with the exception of the source control access, which we do for, for certain parties under uh, NDA and, and licensing. Um, I, think we've I think we've answered that. Because remember, this was also ScreenOS product, which yes, people are still using. Uh, it was a completely different pro uh, uh, model than we do for Junos, completely different. Okay. Any questions? Yes. So, uh, my name is Jim Galvin, and I, something just occurred to me in listening to the last question, because um, he asked you about, uh, you know, how did you, uh, the presumption was that trust in Juniper would have gone down as a result of the incident, and so what are you doing to bring it back up? And actually, I want to I challenge the assertion that that's what happened, because I think 
What would you say? Um, I mean, I get out of a lot of what you said, and something that I've always felt about security and security incidents is the fundamental problem is the fact that people really don't seem to care. I mean, not enough people or not the right people care. So did your trust, did trust in Juniper go down? Eh, maybe there was a you know, tiny little blip for a moment among people who are practitioners, but in reality, as a practical matter, who noticed and who really cared and why would it matter? And wouldn't you say that that's part of the problem that we're dealing with here and in the large? It, it seems that's part of the message that you're trying to convey here. You know, I, I hear you. It's not so much, and that's a com more of a complacency, I think is kind of what you're addressing. And, and I'd say no, I think the, pr the practitioners, uh, we had, without a doubt, our biggest response was, you were quick to respond, you were open and transparent as much as you can be on this problem, and you, re and you, and you corrected it, right? Um, so if there was a blip, I think it was restored. In fact, to a customer, that, was the, that has been their response. And that's just because they're, they, they're being nice. They were just honest. Because it does happen. It's not, this is not unique to Jennifer. We all know this. this uh, but the complacency issue, I think, is less about lack of interest than that's the way of the world. How many, how many updates do we get across our portfolio each week? It used to be a lot. You know, Patch Tuesday was, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going on vacation Monday night, right? There's no way I'm going to be around on Patch Tuesday. It's gotten better, but we also have a lot more in our, in, our, in our inventory. So we're always constantly patching. That goes back to my management plane discussion. So we expect that now, and I'm saying let's not expect that. Let's change the entire paradigm to reduce the noise is what I'm suggesting. Does, it, does that make sense? Tobias gone on Huawei. Um, I'm, I'm looking at this from a, like, what is your expectation towards the IETF question uh, in terms of improving security? And one of the things that I noticed, I mean, IETF, we, we kind of wake, wake up and then we try to do things, but our standards process is also not the shortest, maybe not as bad as ANSI, but we take some time. Uh, and then at the same time, there's this open source community, which kind of moves a little bit faster. And I wonder, like, um, what is your view? Like, what would be your advice? I mean, is it like, do you feel like, oh, open source is actually solving your problems and maybe standardization is actually not fast enough for what you need? Is there something you would like to advise us on how we can work better? Um, some ideas from your side. Would be no, I, I, Tobias, correct. I appreciate the question. Um, Two quick answers. One is my expectation, my ask, not expectation, but my ask of IETF, and by the way, it's not just IETF, I had the same conversations with the open source communities too, is think differently to, 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 to abuse Apple, right? Think different. When you design assuming harm as a starting principle can go a long way. We will find out, I guess the other question, earlier question with regard to what do we do with training the next generation, is if they, if they come out of school thinking this way, can you imagine the next, the next generation of protocols? Completely different, right? That's my ask of IETF, to think a little differently, right? And I, and I was somewhat prescriptive of what I'm asking for as a practitioner. But at the end of the day, um, we have what we have. You know, what we have is, is what we have for now. If you think about it, 30 years is a long time. Think about a car in 1986 and a car in 2016. Think about the internet in, 2000, I mean, in, in, in 1986 and 2016. The big difference is just scale, frankly. But cars are radically different. They're smarter, they're quicker, they're safer. We have to think different. And oh, by the way, when you talk to the car folks, they came in at kicking and screaming. They did not, because why? What they were building was fine. They sold, they made money. But when people start dying, things started to change. So I'm asked, my ask of IETF is to think different. Any new protocol, especially one that has ramifications for broad ramifications, consider some of the prescripts that I had suggested. That's all. all right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.
Hey, my bag, I'm sorry.